The Therapy is a Christian podcast is all things mental health and Christ. We specifically talk about how mental health and God are merged together to foster growth, healing, and making mental health a normal conversation. I'm your host, Roz and Renee, and welcome to the show. Are you someone that constantly procrastinates? You feel overwhelmed and don't know where to start? You plan a long list of to-dos and they never get done? Maybe you self-sabotage on your goals or things you want to do. Do you know that I've been doing time management coaching now for about two years? Yes, sis. I have coached over 60 plus women on how to better manage your time and overcome self-sabotage and procrastination. This time I want to help you. I'm offering for a very short time one-on-one strategy calls. On these calls, we'll go over all of your needs related to time management, and I'll give you some quick tips to help you learn how to manage your time better. If you're needing that direct help, I've got you. Go to rosalindrenee.com and scroll to where it says book a call with me and go to the link in the show notes to get on my calendar. I can't wait to help you, sis. Now let's get to the show. Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Therapy is a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Roz Renee, and welcome to another episode of the show. And I am super excited about this interview, y'all, because (laughs) I have such an amazing, 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 amazing interviewee that I am super excited for y'all to hear about. Her story is just so powerful, so amazing. And I'm going to give you a little backstory. So we actually met through my therapist, who I've talked (laughs) to y'all about a little bit on the podcast. But I remember it was probably back in 2019 or maybe like end of 2018. I can't remember exactly, (laughs) but it was around that time. And I was telling my therapist, I was like, I feel like I just need a coach. Like I need somebody to help me figure out what I need to do in business, Mm -hmm. what I need to do just in general. And so she sent me Rochelle's information. And I remember when I talked to her, I was like, oh, I love this girl. Like, I really, really love like all the stuff she's about. <laughs> we started talking about business. We started talking about all types of things. And then we got connected via social media. And then I didn't see her for a while. And then mm-hmm. she came back up on my timeline. I was like, oh, my God. It started talking about all the stuff she's doing and all the stuff she was just going through in the past. And so I was like, oh, girl, I am cheering you on. Woo, woo, girl, yes. And then we just got connected. We voice memoed each other through Instagram. And here we are. So y'all are about to be in for a, like a good episode because we did our consult over Zoom and baby girl. <laughs> Stop talking. So, Rochelle, why don't you introduce yourself, say hey to everyone, and tell them a little bit about you? Yes. So, my name is Rochelle Howard. I am a life coach and counselor. I'm currently from, well, I'm from Florida, but I live in Alabama. I have been in the mental health space for about eight years. I've been in the coaching space for about four, going on five. And yeah, like, I just, I literally have this heart for helping people become well acquainted with their stories in order for them to receive a lot of healing in their identity. But I also believe in the power of God giving us the tools to really rewrite our stories, right? Especially as it relates to trauma, just daily life experiences. Like God has really given us the grace to partner with him to rewrite our own narratives. That way we can have a better perspective one that serves us in a more healthier way. And so that's in essence what I do day to day. I help women rewrite their stories so that they're able to overcome limiting beliefs, overcome fear mindsets so that they can go off and live a life of purpose and fulfillment. So I love it. Yes. So okay. So why don't you tell us, so I heard you say you've been in the mental health space for a while and then in coaching. Yeah. So what got you into the mental health space and then oh. coaching? Oh my gosh. Okay. It's such a story. I think honestly, when people come from patterns of trauma, they have this heart to either one, serve people the way that they may not have been served, but they also have this ability to be empathetic to people's circumstances so much so that they're like, 
I did not go through the trauma that I went through to not show up and help somebody else. So that's in essence, I initially thought I was going to be like in the business world when I was back in undergrad and literally going into my senior year, like couple semesters left before I walked the stage, the Lord was like, you're actually going to go into the mental health field. So I went to my advisor. He looked at me like I had three heads and I was like, I need to change my major like today. He's like, you're about to walk in a couple months. I was like, I know, but I got to do it. And so it just started this whole journey. I ended up staying for an extra several semesters to finish up my degree. I went straight into grad school in Baltimore and I started working with youth who struggled with like suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety. I did that for a couple of years. I went to a trauma center where we did a lot of play therapy with youth. As you can see the theme, I experienced a lot of trauma in my adolescent, those youth years. So my heart was like, I got to go help them. But then I felt like I was getting a little burnt out in that therapeutic space. But I also knew that God had given me a gift of wisdom and really helping people experience healing so that they can go forward into things he's called for them to do. And so I shifted gears and started coaching. And I told all my clients, I still get a chance to do the deep work. It just looks different. Like you can't not present a pressing emotional issue or a story to someone who is a therapist and them not want to unpack it. So we still do unpack it, right? But I have to also still like remind myself, like, okay, you're not their therapist. You can do deep work because you are one, but you also need to remember that we have to take them somewhere. And that's where the coaching really uh, shifts in. So you've done different types of coaching. I heard you say life Mm -hmm. coach. So Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that because life coaching is a little bit different from just in general counseling. I I think just in general. And I want to make this disclaimer because I always say this, that coaching and therapy are different. Two different things. Just because I'm a therapist <laughs> does not mean that I am doing therapy when I'm coaching. There are a lot of things that come up related to emotional wellness and all of that mm-hmm. in coaching mm-hmm. because I do think that those are the stopping points that stop us Absolutely. from being point B. Absolutely. However, there's way more processing with therapy. There's way more mm-hmm. sitting in your feelings. There's way more. Mm-hmm. And two, you're covered under the laws of HIPAA, whereas coaching right. isn't. I'm very mm-hmm. direct. I'm very like, I'm putting you in the game coach kind mm-hmm. of thing. And so right. with life coaching and just yeah. with some of the things you've done with women, what mm-hmm. have you seen be the difference from the mental health space in particular versus doing actual coaching and even the That's transformation good. you've seen with women? Absolutely. That's a great question. And that is one of the primary things that you have to always reiterate. When you're entering into that coaching space, you're like, hey, I am not your therapist. We're going to process that. Like, for instance, a lot of the women I work with struggle with like limiting mindset beliefs. They feel like they're not adequate, like they're not equipped, like they're not good enough. There are some fears surrounding that, right? And so a lot of the work that I do is narrative therapy, but it's almost like narrative coaching. So we're not sitting down to unpack every single experience. And in the now in the therapeutic space, we're gonna start to create some type of timeline find sequence of events, you know, things like that and start to unpack it to unravel limiting beliefs. But in the coaching space, it's like, okay, within the past six months or within the past maybe eight to 12 months, let's target one particular event. And it's almost like therapy, but on like an accelerated track. We need to get a general consensus of what the storyline is that I love story. It's like everything because everything, everything speaks, right? All of our experiences speak, but in the coaching space, you're finding quick stories that have great impact and giving them the tools to unpack it. Not now we're not going to unpack, you know, maybe like a form of abuse that you encountered when you were six. Now I'm not saying that may not come up, But we try to stay within the latest like six to 12 months, find an experience. Now, there typically is going to be some correlation between some past experience and we can discuss that. But if it's something that really needs to be unpacked, we can unpack a portion of it. And then from there, give directives on how, like, for instance, like a lot of narrative stuff that I do with my clients is we'll unpack an experience. We'll find the voice. We will find the truth. It's a lot of, you know, cognitive behavioral on like acceleration mode. Mm -hmm. And then from there... Right now, we're, we're starting to put in practical things in real time to start to combat that limiting belief. However, with a therapy, you know, with a therapy session, we actually may start to unpack that over several weeks. So they're still unpacking, but we can't do as much in coaching. At that point, I will 
start the process, but I will also say, hey, you need to make sure that you touch base with your therapist, let them know that we talked about this this week, and then you do more of your deeper unpacking there. Yeah. So it's like therapy. It's just, it's, It's I don't even know how to explain it, but it's not, it's not, but it kind of is. But you talk about a lot of the emotional things because that is, and this is why I'm so passionate about what I'm talking about, because the emotional things can be the stumbling blocks they are that cause absolutely the they things impact you want mindset. to do yeah like mm-hmm. yes yes it yes. impacts and, your mindset and, and asking you that before I go to mm-hmm. my next question what would you yeah, yeah. define as mindset because I know that that's a lot of it's not a normal mm-hmm. word people just throw around I know this mm-hmm. we may know but how would you say or put into your own words the definition of mindset Absolutely. I would say mindset is the container of perspective by which I move and decide to move or choose not to move. So if I have this container and from that container, I believe that I'm not capable, I'm not able, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I don't have the skill sets, whatever, I'm going to now look at everything that God has given me to do, whether it be business, whether it be showing up in friendships, whatever, from that container. That is my mindset. And so the goal of coaching, when especially when it comes to mindset coaching, is we need to figure out how did this container get to this place, right? We need to unpack it and fill it up with more useful and adaptive tools so that when you go for and you get a directive or you your purpose or you're trying to do something new, like go for a promotion, you're doing it from a more healthier place as opposed to the tainted container, which is in more so of the, the self-sabotaging beliefs and the, you know, more maladaptive mindset yep, character. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So let's get deep for a second. So let's do it. <laughs> we met back in the timeline of 2019. 2019? Yeah, because yeah. I just got married. Going into year. 2020. Mm-hmm. So for you personally, what happened in 2020 that had a shift where you stopped coaching? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question. Okay. Because it's such a story. I think you've already heard this, but mm-hmm. I, I got to tell it for the people, right? So 2019, I got married. And um, we got married in August of 2019. We recently relocated from Georgia to Alabama, which is where my husband's from. And so literally at the top of the year, I was in the process of doing another cohort for my coaching program. And for the first like two months I did, you know, my marketing, like I was like on fire. I was like, 2020 is going to be the year. Like it's lit. I'm about to serve another cohort of ladies. Let's go. And so right when I opened the doors, I, you know, got the opportunity to serve a couple ladies in my cohort. Right towards the end of the cohort around March, I was having a lot of symptoms around the time where I got married. Like I started going through a lot of like abdominal pain. My cycles are really heavy. I like my bladder was like incredibly weak. And these are things that I never, ever experienced before. So this had gone on from like August 2019 up until March. But then like March, things were just like odd. Like it was just weird. It seemed like my symptoms were kind of exasperated. And so as I was literally wrapping up my cohort with that particular group of ladies, I ended up going to my OB and she literally sat me on the table and was like, Hey, have you always, well, she was a new OB. So this is like literally our first appointment because I had just relocated. And she was like, have you always had this tumor? And I'm like, Sir, what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, um, you have a really large tumor inside of your uterus. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, it's almost like I froze in the doctor's appointment because I did not know that that was like the cause of like all of my symptoms. But she was so like nonchalant about it. She's like, you always had this tumor. I'm like, "Um, excuse me, what, what, what tumor? And so long story short, she ended up sending us to a fertility specialist who specialized in that particular surgery because the size of it was like double the size of my uterus and it was inside on the back wall. And so she sent us to a fertility specialist because they were the top in the Alabama area to perform that type of surgery, which is a myomectomy, an abdominal myomectomy. And so we went to this specialist and we scheduled, she did like measurement. She was telling us how big it was, how it was causing a lot of my symptoms. I was tired. I was bleeding like crazy. Like it was crazy. And she ended up scheduling us for me to have a a myomectomy, which is in essence, like a C-section on crack. Like (laughs) it was horrible, but we'll get to that. And so 
we scheduled to have the surgery like the third week of March, but around that time was when COVID cases started popping up out of like just the Wahoo, right? And so she literally called me and was like, hey, like the week of the surgery, she called me on a Tuesday and she's like, hey, we have to reschedule it. And so for the next couple months, and because they shut down all elective surgeries, you know, nationwide, they call that an elective surgery. And so I'm like, bro, I'm in pain. <laughs> I don't even know what to do, but there was nothing we could do. So from like March to like May, I was like under trying to do a lot of pain management. Like my digestive system was off. I couldn't eat a lot. Like it was just, the tumor was literally like taking up so much space. I had developed a lot of anemia. And so crazy long story short, I had the surgery in May and the recovery time knocked me on my face, like on my face, on my feet, on my side, all the things. As I mentioned before, an abdominal myomectomy for the size of tumor that I had, it was very, very hard on my body. I had never had a surgery before. That was my first major surgery. I had never experienced that kind of incision. Like it was all so new. And so the healing process took longer than I anticipated. Like at the time I was preparing, I wanted to start like a new cohort that summer. And here I am in bed. I couldn't shower on my own. I couldn't walk. I couldn't drive for like two months. And while my husband, he's an administrator in the education world. Now, while he's getting up and going to his school, like I'm literally in bed, can't move. Like I could move a little bit, but it was a journey. Like having to keep a pillow on my stomach just to like try to roll over in the bed. And all of that sitting affected me mentally. Like I was the type of person that was always ready to like coach another group of women, you know, pour into them. And I felt so like I had never had my body not work well, right. Or have to recover for something big. And that really like affected my, like my mental state. I felt like if I couldn't get up and move around and go cook dinner or go do this or go jump in my car and go over here and jump to this meeting or even have the mental capacity to do that then I was not like good enough. And so for those two months, while my body was like getting used to having to get its strength back, my mind was starting to lose strength because I didn't realize how much hope I had put in my body, but also on my ability to keep doing. I didn't realize how much hope I put in that. So when I couldn't do I felt like I just was like not good enough. And so that's in essence when I stopped coaching. I recovered over the series of a couple months. And at the time we started going through fertility treatment. And so having to go through that while my body was still healing, a lot of the treatments weren't successful because I still had a lot of scar tissue. So there, every time that a treatment wasn't successful, it really damaged my, like my identity. Cause I'm like, Instead of me just saying, counting that isolated incidents, it's like, okay, this treatment didn't work this month because now we were starting like this fertility journey because the reason why we couldn't conceive at the time was because of the tumor. So instead of me treating those upcoming treatments is like, okay, this didn't work because of scar tissue. You had to have the surgery. Thank God they caught it. I took it as this treatment didn't work. God, why did you allow a tumor to be inside of me? Like, If I didn't have that tumor, I wouldn't have had to go through that surgery. And if I didn't go through that surgery, I wouldn't have had the scar tissue. And like, it was just like this catastrophizing whirlwind where I just did not know how to see that surgery as like, God, you allowed this to happen um, in the sense of like, you allowed them to get it out of me before it caused other issues. And so I stopped coaching because the disappointment of like having to sit down for those couple months really got to like my identity and my word, but also the future, like all the treatments that we were going through. And the same answer was like, it's just the scar tissue. It's the scar tissue. Everything else is fine. It's the scar tissue. Like it just started, I started to internalize that as not seeing it as like the scar tissue. I'm like, it's me. It's my body. It's something I'm not doing right. I'm not used to putting my hands to something and it not working. So all those disappointments were like, okay, this is an identity thing. So there's no way I can show up and coach people. There's no way. I can't coach ladies into identity and purpose. And I feel like mine has literally been ripped from underneath my feet. So it started with the surgery, but that surgery was just one moment that trickled into other moments. And because I just didn't, it was such a traumatic time in general, like just my body and my mind, I did not know how to analyze the situation from what it was. And because of that, it cycled into other areas. And so instead of me trying to overcome one 
mindset belief or one thought about who I was, it trickled into like, your body's not working. And then you're not good enough. And then are you really a woman? Cause you had to have that surgery. And like, all of these thoughts. So then you sit down, you like where I could have initially dealt with the emotional trauma of having the surgery, because I just didn't do it right. When I did sit down later on in the year, and we'll talk through that, I was sitting there with all of these thoughts that this became my identity marker. And now I felt like I will never get the work done because I should have addressed this months ago. Okay, so I have to stop you. (laughs) I know this whole story is crazy. Wow. There's a couple things in there that she said that I'm going to just kind of like say back. It sounds mm-hmm. like there was a lot of, let me ask this question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think one thing that is extremely hard to process through and like you always talk about on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. I think in general, we always just talk about the other side of the trial. Yeah. yeah. When you're in the thick of it, mm-hmm. you lose faith. Like your faith is like gone. You don't Absolutely. have faith. You don't have faith. Mm-hmm. You feel like you said, you said a couple of things about how can I coach people about identity and all of these. Mm-hmm. I myself am also like working. So, so you feel like <laughs> an imposter. You feel like a fraud. Yeah. You mm-hmm. feel like you're being attacked in the main area that you teach, which is yeah. a whole nother story. Oh, yeah. And, but also too, you had already had previous evidence of doing the calling. Yes. So when yes. you are doing it and mm-hmm. then it's almost like all of it goes away. Yeah. Like there's no way I can do this again. There's no mm-hmm. way I can even bounce back because you're mm-hmm. in, like literally in the middle of it. And so mm-hmm. for you, how did the surgery impact your calling? Like mm-hmm. it's about mm-hmm. your identity, your own personal yeah. feelings. Yeah. But like verbalize the feelings of what it felt like to start doing the thing that God had called you to do, making the strides, making the steps. Because I think there are a lot of people who either are in that space where they start and then they stop because of identity things, but also how did that trial just impact your calling? Yeah, that's good. You know, honestly, I think one, I think we as a people, and I'll even get more specific as it relates to believers, I think sometimes we can make the idea of purpose like an idol. And God revealed that to me during surgery. In my mind, instead of just knowing that I'm like, I'm worth it and I'm good because I am a child of God. Somewhere along the way, I tied me being a child of God with also having the fruit of showing up in my purpose. But they're two very separate things. Before I show up as a coach, before I show up as a counselor, as a wife, as a do- as anything, I belong to God, period. And I am loved and seen and valuable in the sight of God. Okay, let me pause so- too, because I think there's so much shame attached when you have that realization because- yeah feel bad about the fact that you did idolize your purpose. But I Mm -hmm. think that you have to, and everybody that's listening, you have to understand that God has to reveal that to you through trial. Absolutely. In order to begin to say to you, like, this is why this is, I won't even say faulty, but just, it doesn't stand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God stands above that because- Above it. (laughs) Because you could be walking in purpose all day. It's not to happen- And And you got to stop. And you got stopped. And that you feel like that's your identity. But in general, you could be out for the count for months. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, still be God's kid. But you don't know know that until you're in it. So people who shame themselves for starting and stopping, starting and stopping. You have Mm -hmm. to realize that purpose is not the. It's not a destination. It's not a destination, but it's not the pillar. It's not no. the pillar of who you are. And uh-uh. that can feel very much so like it, especially in the age we live now with walking towards purpose because we do feel it in our hearts. Mm-hmm. But we also have to get very clear about the fact that God is our father and he is the one we do anything with, for, about, regardless. Mm-hmm. And so if he takes those things away, you, yeah. still have, you still have an identity. And I think that's... Mm-hmm. We still have to be able to stand in that. And it doesn't even necessarily look like, and I'm glad you gave that disclaimer. It may not look like, oh, well, I'm in my purpose. Oh, am I idolizing? Like, we don't want you to be afraid, 
do no. what God has called you to do, you but mean. also be mindful that at any moment life can happen and you may have to pause. And when you have to pause, that pause will put a demand on where you found your value at what? or Girl. or where you place it at. But here's the really awesome thing about such a merciful and a patient and a gracious God. God was not like, you know, while I was laying in my bed recovering, he wasn't like, see, Rochelle, you were, you started to get really excited about only doing purpose. Like he wasn't slapping me on my hand. He was like, Rochelle, you're in a season of needing to heal. Rochelle, I know you did not understand this, but while you are healing, let's commune together and let me show you who you really are. And so we put so much pressure on ourselves. Right. Like, I gotta do that. I gotta do that. I gotta. gotta. No, 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 no. God was trying to teach. God can teach you lessons while you were functioning. And I believe everything is purposeful. I just think some seasons it manifests very differently. It shows up very differently. But the same lessons God can teach you while you are here launching and doing and marketing and doing all this are the same. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to give my point. Listen, because over the past three months, he has been kicking my butt. And I'm like, listen, start. He's like, hold on, okay? I I didn't know all this was there, but... Mm-hmm. I can only say that purpose is not the thing that's the pillar because mm-hmm. it changes. It changes. It, it will it vacillate. Changes. Yeah. It changes, but also the level of pressure that happens has mm-hmm. to occur for mm-hmm. the anointing of what you, because I could keep Literally. going towards, I could keep going towards what I think is right. But three mm-hmm. down the line, my values are going to shift because one, like yep. my son is going to be three. So the time is going to be mm-hmm. different. So God's yep. looking for those times. Absolutely. That are, Absolutely. I'm not thinking about. And so his divine plan is always to yeah. create long-term than be mm-hmm. in just where we are. And so I think, like you said, yeah. it, it shows up and it manifests differently. But I want to interrupt mm-hmm. you. So keep going, talking about how it impacted your calling. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing was like, I had to learn to sit. And that impacted my calling because a lot of what I felt was my calling, which is to like help women get unstuck mentally, emotionally in their minds in order to move forward into who they are, most importantly, and what God has called for them to do in the season. It's like, but that requires movement. I can't move because I'm stuck. In my mind, I'm like, I'm stuck healing. Not I'm healing physically, mentally from this very big surgery, but I'm stuck. You see that one word, me saying I'm stuck here means that I don't want to be here. I'm kicking and screaming while I'm here. I'm ready to get out. God's like, no, you're not stuck healing. I have you healing. Totally different. So it caused me to surrender much differently to that process to learn who I was apart from what I did. And that helped really plant a different level of root into how I saw God and how I saw myself through the eyes of God. It shifted everything. So I guess in the essence, like it impacted my calling. That surgery impacted my calling because I had to actually take time to sit with why I do what I do. Who am I apart from what I do? What's the real impact of serving people? So like now that I'm doing my coaching programs again, I show up much differently because I know I only have you for a season. So if God decided to shut this program down after I'm done with y'all, I have to sit down. But I have to also be able to look back and say that I gave my all during the time that I had you. So my whole perspective of like God is not I'm going to get ladies to coach, but now it's God has entrusted me with people for this specific time of their life and of my life, it hits different. It hits different because I'm now aware because of that surgery that at any given moment, something could shift. Can I say that I knew who I was apart from what I did, but that when God entrusted me with people to serve, that I gave them my all because it's about who God assigns to you, not just doing things to say you did them. It shifted everything. Girl, girl. Shifted everything. And also it requires a higher level of integrity. Yes. It it requires a lot. Because I think, especially in business, and I know you know this too, Mm -hmm. that people can just be out here and really doing things 
in a way where God is placed it in your heart, there's just a higher level of integrity and treating people mm-hmm. with respect and regard. I've been in situations where I've invested in different things where I just have felt like I was just another number. Just yeah, another I wasn't taken care of, just another yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Luckily, it hasn't that's been few and far between, but yeah. that feeling can often feel very like it's mm-hmm. not, I don't mm-hmm. matter. And yeah. so I think there's just a higher level of regard when you are caring for people and just what mm-hmm. you can do and provide in their lives. Like you said, you have them for a season and that season yeah. can be so impactful to uh, mm-hmm. the rest of their lives. There've been so Absolutely. many situations I've made investments and that one thing impacted so many others. And so I think yeah. that, that makes a difference in the way you show up, but also why trial becomes so necessary. It's ghetto. It's real it's ghetto. So ghetto. It's ratchet. It's ghetto. It's, it's just, foolery. It's just it's not. It, to, me, to me, it's really like one of those things where you see yourself and you don't like it, but you have to. Mm-hmm. But you have to sit. Yeah. It's so, like him just holding up a mirror the whole time. And he's like, I don't want to look. Girl, like, yes. Oh, no, you I, need listen. To look. Ugly. <laughs> you so, need to look, girl. So for <laughs> you, what were some of the, like being in the thick of that, Mm-hmm. and like healing mm-hmm. in the middle of that you're so angry probably having a mm-hmm. lot of feelings of disappointment a yeah. lot of, and I'm big on saying like I'm not gonna ever say I don't tell God like I'm angry with you I'm really upset mm-hmm. with you what mm-hmm. were some of the feelings you had towards God that you know impacted the way you showed up for yourself but also within your relationship with him yeah I felt like God singled me out and I was incredibly pissed. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like, I'm not gonna sit up here and be like, oh well, that's just the trial. So oh, I'm just gonna, it. I'm just gonna submit. I'm gonna put my sackcloth and ashes on. I'm just gonna endure, and I'm just gonna go through this fire because God chastens those that He loves. That was not my response. Nope. I was like, in the beginning, I'm like, okay, God, like, thank you. You know, we had the surgery. Thank you for, like, I was filled with gratitude in the beginning until I realized what that process was really about. (laughs) In the beginning, I was like, thank you, Jesus. Like, we found it, praise God. And then, like, a week started to go by, and my strength was coming slowly. And I was mindful of my limitations physically and mentally and emotionally. And the enemy was clearly having a a whole field day in my mind as far as, like, just my identity. And I felt like I definitely became very depressed at one point of that healing process. But in essence, I felt very singled out by God. I think 2020 by itself was a lot clearly, but I felt like it hit different for me because I'm like, out of all the years that you could have allowed me to have to go through this, you chose this year. Like this had to be, this was the trial. not Not only that, but like, I think sometimes you get to the point where you think to yourself, you know, Lord, I'm faithful. Like, I mean, listen, I mean, listen, I, I've, listen. I've been on my face. I, 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 wake, I, I wake serve up. you. I fast. I, you know, and at that point I was, I hadn't quite come up on a year of marriage yet. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> just all the, like, as I can be real honest, I definitely feel like there was a lot of pride in my heart. Of like, oh, period. You yes. know what I'm saying? You ain't, like, you ain't had a sugar coated. I mean, seriously, you know, I've gone to God multiple married. times. Listen. We I, waited all the things, uh, you know, all these things of like, because of the relationship and the rapport that I've had with you. How dare you let this be the thing that, that like is really challenging my identity? Like I'm a good daughter to you. How could you let this be the trial? You could have anything else could have took me out, but how dare you? Like I was pissed. I was mad at God. In the beginning, it was all, you know, thank you, Lord, we caught it. Recovery is going well. But when that recovery was really starting to check the idols in my heart, as far as like my identity, who I really am in God, what he's called me to do, a lot of thoughts that he needed me to completely separate from about my work and the work that I did. Like I was mad. I'm like, bro. And then at that point you start taking inventory, not only of that moment, but other things that you had to go through. And so then there's like some resentment because you like, God, have I not gone through enough in this lifetime for you to just... I just felt so singled out and I didn't have 
because it was happening in 2020, there wasn't a lot of space to vent about how frustrated I was with healing because everybody was going through in 2020. So then there's resentment towards like, the people around you and God, because you like, I don't even know who to process this with because everybody going through, but I feel like I'm going through much different. Like God, hold up. So in essence, I was very angry because I felt like I just, I was serving God, man. Like I was loving on him. He was loving on me. And I felt like that trial almost like literally took me out. Eventually that shifted, but in the process for a lot of it, I was very upset my devotion life shifted. Like I wasn't in my word as much. I wasn't trying to be in worship like that. Like I really like fell into like a really hardcore depression. Do you struggle with being consistent with God or have you fallen off your routine and really need to get back on to spending quality time with God daily? Do you find that when you actually do sit down with God, you don't really know where to start, what to read, and you really don't know how to make your routine work best for you? Well, you absolutely need the Time with God course. So let me tell you all about Assist. In this course, I discuss with you how you can actually spend time with God and study the Bible. In the first class, I teach you all the tools you need, how you can look at time with God as a benefit and not a duty or a chore, or even feel bad when you don't don't spend time with God. And I even give you some strategies on how you can spend quality time with him where you actually feel like you're building a relationship with him. In the second video, I share with you how to actually study the Bible. I give you over 11 different ways to read the Bible so that you can switch up your time with the Lord. Switch up your time with God and learn a fresh way on how to spend time with him. And if you purchase this course, you get the Time with God ebook absolutely free. In this ebook, I have over 23 different devotionals that you can take part in on the Bible app, 21 different Christian books, 31 of my favorite sermons, and two worship playlists. So you can never say you don't have anything to do in your time with God. Remember, when you purchase the course, you get this ebook absolutely free. So go to rosandrenee.com backslash time with God or go to the link in the description. Again, that's Rosa Renee backslash time with God, or go to the link into the description. Now let's get back to the show. I want to pull out a couple of things you said, because I think yeah. when we lose faith, the things that work for us quickly go out the window. Yeah. Out of one, I believe, two, well, I think two things, it could be either or. I think mm-hmm. God shifts the way that we do devotion with him. And yeah. What I've learned for me personally in just like my walk in business is that devotion is active. Yes. Being like, it's not just you sometimes studying Rosalind, it's you Mm-mm. taking the word and then yeah. acting on it. It's Absolutely. Like taking it, believing it, and then acting in it. And mm-hmm. Sometimes that is me only dwelling on a couple scriptures. And mm-hmm. sometimes I'm holding on to them things for dear life. Okay. Mm-hmm. But the other piece of that could be. God also shifting our devotion in old seasons because sometimes we can hold on to those seasons where we're super devoted, we're in our word, Mm -hmm. we're seeking God hard, we're in our prayer, Mm -hmm. we're in our fasting, and we hold on to those old seasons as that was when I was a good Christian versus Mm -hmm. when we're in a new place now. What God showed me in that time where I was really comparing myself to old seasons where I was like, man, I was in my word back then. Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. you are in a completely different place and you cannot put new wine in your wineskins. Absolutely. Your capacity is different. Your lifestyle is different. You're not, <laughs> at that time it was just mm-hmm. me and Nico. You're a mom now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Your capacity mm-hmm. is completely different yeah. versus yeah. then. You can't mm-hmm. spend three hours in the morning because you got to get a baby ready so like Mm -hmm. there's so much difference in those things and so I think we look at you know when we're in those seasons they go out the window because they have they're being refined but also they're necessary they are going back to the basics Mm -hmm. of getting out of those spaces you run back to the basics of knowing what worked Mm -hmm. and so like what did that look like for you when that shifted Yeah. And to add to what you said, I think beyond things being different for us, right? Like whatever the capacity is from a previous season, you know, you were single or like, you know, I know my devotion might look very different when I was single to when I was married to like, it looks different, right? Or like when you're a mom or when you, you know, whatever, we're also learning God differently, right? Like we are different, 
but we're also like God is showing us in those other seasons how to learn a different side of him. So could it be that I put God in this box of like my 20, 30 minute or hour long devotion in the morning and that's the only way I can commune with him? Maybe I was starting, I needed to learn how to commune with him a little differently. So devotion for me, at some time, it was just like, you know, I was able, like, Lord, give me strength to roll over and literally physically get out of the bed. And I watched him do that. Or like, Lord, if I can, I used to use my living room as a marker because I couldn't really walk that well for a good little minute. And so I'd be like, Lord, just let me get to the edge of the couch. Like, like, just let me get to the edge of the couch. And then he would start he, just like, you got it. Like I would need to take a break just to breathe. And, but then after I took that break, he would have, he answered that prayer. Cause I was able to touch the, it just looked different. Same God. Scripture says he's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. So regardless of the season I'm in, he's not changing, but maybe the way that I commune with him, it may need to look different. One of the biggest lies is the enemy will make you think that God has changed. Listen, not only that, but that we have to stay the same along with that. Right. I'll give my example of like devotion time. When I first had Elijah, I was, you know, just expecting I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, period. I also thought I was going to hop back into business. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, girl, don't worry about it. Yeah, right away. It's not bad. Chop loose. (laughs) Right. No sleep with a newborn. And then if you're breastfeeding, it's really like you definitely don't sleep. Mm-hmm. I remember one night that I will never forget this. I used to get up. So I think at this point, Elijah probably was around like two to three months. So he was giving longer stretches of sleep in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. So I would probably get maybe like three hour stretches, maybe four hour stretches at night. So, so there was one night was where one- I was pumping. I would still get up in the middle of the night to pump. I would wake up maybe two to three times at night to pump. And I remember I was so tired and my mom was coming the next day to help Mm -hmm. me. I said, okay, Mm -hmm. she's going to come the next day. I'm going to work on some business stuff and all of that. I was Mm -hmm. so tired. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, tomorrow rest. Mm -hmm. This is the devil. I I am the devil. This is the devil. I am not sleeping tomorrow. I have stuff done. And heard Holy Spirit say, would the enemy tell you to rest? He wouldn't. He'd make you burn out. And you that was the indicator that yeah. I was yeah. like, okay, Father. Mm-hmm. And I slept the next day. Mm-hmm. And I was like a different person the following day. Mm-hmm. I thought to myself in the moment at that point, God showed up for me when he knew I didn't know I needed it. And that yeah, devotion yeah. was different. It wasn't it me different. sitting down in front of my word, not to say that right. it was important or valuable. Right, right. It just looked but different. Also, it also made me realize that rest is worship because it I is. needed that at the time to show mm-hmm. up for myself, to show up for my baby, to show up and just mm-hmm. be a mom. But also mm-hmm. like the wear and tear I'm putting on my body mentally yeah. to be yeah. every woman was not Mm -hmm. who I needed to be in that moment. And so I think Mm -hmm. it can be a guilt and a shame with that. Absolutely. Also, it also just made me see that God showed up for me when I didn't know I needed it Mm -hmm. at all. And he was releasing you from that pressure of things that didn't really give you identity. Being able to be all the things to all the people is not how God created you to be. That's a whole other conversation about boundaries, but it's just interesting how God will use those seasons to show you more of who he is, but also to show you more of how you were created initially to be. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. So for you, when did mm-hmm. the shift start happening? Like, so going mm. that, how'd you kind of start coming out of the trial? Yeah. So I actually started coming out of it, like, I would say maybe January of this year. Like, it took all of 2020. It took all the, <laughs> it took all 12 of them months. Do you hear me? And <laughs> I would say January, as I mentioned. What happened? Early. So we decided to stop fertility treatment in January. No, no, no. It was February. But I was coming out of the funk in January. Like, we decided, because the surgery was so hard on my body, a lot of the treatments just were not successful. And that ongoing cycle of like disappointment, hope, disappointment, hope, on top of still trying to work through a lot of the story and the perspective that I picked up from that surgery, it was like, I fell into such a low place from like surgery, surgery was May up until like that December place. I honestly got tired of feeling so hopeless. 
And the Lord would like literally like visit me in my dreams. He would speak with me very softly. Like Holy Spirit was like, Rochelle, first off, y'all need to take a break. If anybody's ever gone through fertility treatment, you know that not only are your hormones completely jacked up, but it is the most exhausting emotional time that I think any woman can go through. Like it's intense and because it's all mental, right? Physical things are happening, but it's really the mental side of it. And so around like January, we literally said like, you know, we're going to try one more treatment, even knowing the doctor had gave us, you know, the disclaimer that treatments may not be successful because of the surgery that I had and just the time frame in which I had it, we still decided to do one more cycle. And I literally like my husband, and I had to have a really long talk, several long talks, but there was one in January in particular where he's like, Rochelle, like, I know that this past year has been really hard for you. And like my husband is just, he's so incredibly present and emotionally just such a solid person in my life. But he's also very like, okay, you've had your time. What do you need? I know you don't need anything else. We don't talk through this. What are you going to do now? He's very solution focused. So he's like, listen, you've had your time to process. You've gone to therapy. You've done all. So what's next? We're at the top of a new year. And I think you really need to pray into like, what's next? So we literally decided that we had one more cycle left in us. And I told him, I said, I got one more cycle after this. Because we sensed the Holy Spirit was telling us to stop. Because we never took a break from surgery. It was like surgery, treatment, back to back every single month up until the new year of this year. And so we literally, like my therapist told me, she said, you know, Rochelle, suffering is optional. Pain is like something that happens, but suffering is optional. And so she was in essence saying that like, how many more times are you still not going to give yourself time to just go and be apart from what you can do, right? So like from the surgery, I learned how to separate myself from this idea of what my body can do, finding value, right? Or as far as attaching it to value. But when we started fertility treatment, it was the same story. What can my body do? Will that give me value? So I was learning the lesson in different parts in different seasons. And so come January, we literally, we did one more cycle. It was not successful. And at that point, we literally booked a trip to Jamaica. And I knew, (laughs) one, we needed to just go and just be, right? Because the past like 12 months were crazy. But I knew by the time we got back that God had given me directives. He's like, okay, listen, you got through last year. You have to make the decision to get up. Like, I believe that God is so dope because he will be father and be loving. And okay, baby girl, let's sit, let's talk, let's process, let's cry. But then after a while, I honestly feel like some of us are like at the pool of Bethesda and like we are literally just sitting on our mat, right? Like God's like, okay, the water is stirred. What you doing? So how many more times are we going to be like, well, God, ain't nobody put me in the water. And I believe that like there comes a point in any it's trial. Like he, in any, he can just get gangster on you, you know what Like I'm he gets thugged. He's like, real okay, gangsta. so what, what's up? What you... Like he I remember, lying. and I, I say, this, girl, and I say this all. The, I tell the story all the time. I remember when I was asking him about something I wanted to do in business, and he said, "What do you want to do?" And I was like, "I don't know. I'm asking you, <laughs> what do I want to do?" This right. Don't, don't even sound like you. Uh-uh. And he's like, "What do you want?" I'm just like, you know, see, this is why I'm just choices mm-hmm. are just too hard. So yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Get back yeah. to. You. And so you got the directives. And so how- I just got the directives. Like he literally was like, by the time y'all get back from Jamaica, you need to like start putting out content. And you need to start showing up again because if you ain't learned nothing else through these past, what, at that point, it was like 12 months from like March to March. He's like, you've learned who you are. You've learned that with my strength and with my grace, you really can overcome anything, but you also learned who you were not. Right. Like I learned that my value and who I am as a woman is just who I am as a woman, because that's how God created me. Not I feel like he used 2020 to sift through the things that I found identity in and oh, I found worth value in. My he smashed it, but he needed to because he knew that this year I would need to show up much differently. So I show up in business much differently. I show up in my marriage much differently because I'm not basing it on performance. I'm basing it on security and who I am in God, point blank, period. Whether I feel the coaching program or not, I'm still a child of God. Whether, you know, everything goes right the first time, like you can't shake me from that. Now things will come up that test that truth. However, the resolve is still the same. Like this is just who I am. And so coming out of it, I felt like I came back with a different level of like authority 
because I knew who God was, but I also learned who I was too. Mm. So coming out was powerful. Like I felt like I literally like hit, like I got like put in like a cannon and God just like lit that mug and just like, shoot. And it's been nonstop beautifully ever since. It's and so powerful. talk about when you started showing back up. Mm-hmm. I think that starting process. Yeah, it's is, hard. Girl, mm-hmm. it's, a it's hard. hard. You think, you think, especially someone again, as who has had and yeah. seen you start walking the process with it. Yeah. Your calling is. Mm-hmm. The things that come to mind for that I think would be thoughts are, can I do this again? Mm-hmm. Are people going to remember? Do I have the ability to change women's lives the way that I have in the past? There is a sense of your confidence. Mm-hmm. And I think confidence comes by doing because you start mm-hmm. to begin. And now one of the prayers I had when I first launched my program and I was starting to see success, I said, God, help me to believe the fruit I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. Almost mm-hmm. then question, is this really like happening? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And so for you, how did the starting process, because it feels slow at first, but then when you start to gain momentum, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. this is the thing. Yeah. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it, it's easy to hear that first part and just be like, okay, just start showing up again. Try please. Listen, I- You feel this pasta syndrome all over again. It was literally all over again because I did have the previous experience of showing up and seeing results. Because I felt like I changed as a person because of that trial, it was challenging for me to still dig back to previous evidence and be like, you could do it. Because now I'm not the same. My point of references are different. Like everything is different. So honestly, I was scared. I was afraid. I'm like, God, these people have seen me show up in this space for the past couple of years. And then I literally fell off the face of the earth. Like people were like, dear, like, where are you at? Are you okay? But I just, I didn't have the emotional strength to respond. And I just remember thinking like, are people going to take me serious? Because I fell off so long and did not give an explanation. That's a sidebar. We do not have to explain to people who are not in our circles of safety, what God is doing in us. Like I think in this nature- Clients, clients, you don't have to explain to clients. You don't. You don't have to even open the door for that. No. Boundaries. Boundaries, but also you create the unrealistic expectation- That you always have to tell them. Of obligation. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. I'm not obligated. And I thank God for stripping me of that because a part of me was like, I got to tell people. Now, eventually I told people that I was away and I needed time, but there was a side of me that used to over-explain all the time. I want to give y'all details. This is what God was dealing with. Like, oh, child, please. I was like, hey, y'all, I'm back. Like, <laughs> um, hey, you know, but there was this sense of imposter syndrome. God, can I, because I am a different person, how do I show up? Do I show up the same way? Am I going to be able to be effective? Like, are people going to take me seriously? What if I start to get consistent and I fall off because something else comes up? That's the one. That's like, the that's one. Just, is, like, yeah. so now I'm putting pressure on myself. Again, there's that track of performance, right? Now I'm putting pressure on myself and really having to lean in the Holy Spirit and ask them, okay, from a wisdom standpoint, because scripture says, and all that getting, get an understanding, right? And so, okay, from an understanding standpoint, Lord, Instead of me pressuring myself to just perform and, and okay, now, now you out here, not great. You got to always show up. I had to really ask Holy Spirit, what is realistic for the season that you have me in? So that way I'm not going back in this cycle of performance mode, you know, still having to keep on going when God's telling me to slow down. So, yeah, I think there was a lot of fear, but I really had to lean into God. And he really just had to remind me ongoing, like, You show up when I tell you to show up. Yes, develop the muscle because there was this urge when I started to shrink back. I'm like, oh, Lord, it's starting to, it's starting again. Like, you know, I'm starting to wonder if I can keep this up. So maybe let me fall back. And so God literally was like, no, 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 stay in the game. You've literally survived one of the hardest years of your life. And if you know that I was with you, then you have to know that I'm with you now. And so I had to make, one, I got a coach, amen, to hold me accountable to still showing up. And I just was like, okay, God, like we kind of made a deal at the top of the year. Like when you pull me out of that season, I'm going to show up and I'm going to serve the people that you called me to serve. Now the enemy will come in 
And he will tell me that, you know, you served in people before. You're not going to show up in that capacity. You're a different person. Will you be able to do this? What, All that what stuff. What you offer doesn't matter. People what you offer doesn't that. matter. You just got challenged in this area. You almost gave it up last year. You did give it up last year. And so I think that's where a lot of the rephrasing and partnering with God, like, no, 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 no. That's not the story. The story is I needed to heal. The story is I had to put things down so that I could heal. The story is God was doing a deeper work in me than I realized. And I'm thankful for that story. Now we are in a new year and I'm well. So now we keep partnering with God to show up, right? Like that's the story shift. And before I ask my last question, I want you to yeah. like in your own definition, mm-hmm what it looks like to partner with God because and I'll give my background this why I'm asking the story mm-hmm. I've realized I think we create the narrative of partnering with God based on what mm-hmm. we've seen other people do mm, like, yeah what, what is real for us because my relationship with God what I've realized is not what other people do I have a higher sense of emotion I'm okay with that because it uh-huh. helps me be in tune with the women mm-hmm. that I serve. Whereas some yeah. people may be more direct in emotion isn't a priority in that sense. That doesn't take away their ability to be impactful, but there are other ways that I'm impactful. And what I've mm-hmm. come to terms with that is that's a part of my relationship with God is I unpack emotions with him. I unpack mm-hmm. those things with mm-hmm. him in probably a more vulnerable way than maybe yeah. I've seen other people do. And I can't even mm-hmm. take on that identity as that that's my relationship and how mm-hmm. I partner with God. The other mm-hmm. thing is I've realized with God is God as a parent, as mm-hmm. my father growing up, I didn't get a lot of choice. A mm-hmm. lot of things were chosen for me. A lot of things mm-hmm. were chosen mm-hmm. all the way up until even me going to grad school. Mm-hmm. Being said now in my relationship with God, God offers a lot of options for choice. That is mm-hmm. extremely scary for someone who for most of young youth all the way up into middle adulthood yeah we had choice I often say to God I have to come with the sense of give me the strength to choose and be okay with that decision it's not Mm -hmm. a okay God help me choose it's more of a lot of times God paints the picture and he gives the choice so partnering with him for me looks a lot different for someone where God it's easy for God to say here's the choice or here's the thing right God. I think it's just partnering with God looks so different for every person's relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For your definition, what do you think that looks like in general? Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I do believe that partnering with God really is contingent on your personal relationship with Him. Like you, I am high emotion. Like I need to be able to sit and weep and be very sad or like very open or just very like raw. Like, I think that's why last year was so hard. Cause I'm like, bro, I'm being all this rawness to you and you still ain't snatching me out this season, you know? But like, I think partnering with God for me is yes. Like the definitely having that raw transparency, because I think that's why God can be so direct with me while also still being like, okay, are you good? You need to cross them all. Like, you you know, you all right. You know, he allows me to come to quick resolve because he gives me space to process really big or what I would, you know, small, whatever, whatever kind of emotion. But he also gives me room to process while still giving me directive. And from the parental standpoint, like my grandmother raised me. And so not having that relationship with my biological parents my grandmother was the same way. Like she was very, let me have my raw emotions, but still help me come to quick resolves. And so I think, but the reason why I trusted the quick resolve is because they let me be, right? And so the theme in that is safety. Partnering with God for me is because I know that I'm safe. I know that he ain't just going to like give me a directive, like for instance, the coaching program doing it. This is my third cohort over the past several years, but this is the first time I've done it like this. The only reason why I could do that, and I'm talking about showed up like every day for like a couple months, just talking to people about it. Like I had never done it like that before, but the reason why I could do it and partner with God on that particular endeavor was because I felt safe. I knew that if I felt unsure I can go to the father and process like, okay, Lord, my identity, 
oh, is this going to work? Like, and he will sit with me and remind me like, okay, get all of it out. Where's this coming from? Are you being triggered by something? Like, what's up? We process and he's like, okay, so whenever you get back up tomorrow, you need to go and mark, you know, market, talk about this today. Like, I think partnering with God means looking at the relationship that you have, finding a common theme for me is safe, being able to be vulnerable about the process with God every step of the way, but also feeling a sense of safety. And when I feel safe, I can trust when he tells me to go do something else because I've learned his nature from that place of safety to know he ain't just going to have me out here. I mean, scripture says he won't allow us to be put to shame, right? And so- I had to realize that like, God ain't just going to have me out here just thugging it out and doing crazy stuff, like, and not doing things that are impactful. Like if I do that, that's going to be on my own accord, not because I listened to God and he gave me a directive and I looked like a fool. Like, so I really think partnering with God is learning the nature of God, the way that you have that individualistic relationship and then choosing to trust when he gives you a directive. I think that's just a part of just knowing his nature. But that's something we learn every single day. Because again, we talked about this today, every season and every trial, they're all going to show you another side of God. I learned the safety of God in this previous season, maybe in a season before it was, I learned the provisional side of God, maybe in the season before it was the the direct nature of God. Like, I think it just depends on the season and really asking God based off of how you have me learn you in this season. How do I take that awareness piece? and apply it to where you currently have me. Hey sis, are you currently in therapy? Then let me tell you about an amazing tool that I created and have been using since I started therapy three and a half years ago. It's called the Therapy Reflection Journal. Have you ever finished a therapy session and thought, girl, what did we talk about? Or a couple of days later, like, gosh, that was such a good point and I don't remember it. Or maybe you want a journal where you can reflect on what you and your therapist discussed to dig deeper into your mental health and really, really, really work on what you and her talked about. Well, I absolutely got you covered since you definitely need the Therapy Reflection Journal. This journal was designed for those of you that are in therapy that want to take notes during your session, write down homework, and it even has reflection pages for you to dig deeper following your sessions. It's basically your therapy journal to track your entire experience. I found that when I was going to therapy, I always would take a blank journal with me. And when my therapist would ask, okay, so how did you um, reflect on last session? I would be flipping through my journal, like, where did I write that down? Where did I write that down? And I wanted to create a structured journal to keep up with all of those sessions, all of those notes, reflections, all in one. I still use mine to this day, literally. And I even refer back to it when I'm looking for different things. You can start using it today, even if you've been in therapy. So... Go ahead and grab your copy by going to rosalrenee.com backslash journal or go to the link in the show notes. I can't wait for you to use it. The Therapy Reflection Journal is your reflection journal for your therapy experience. Now, let's get back to the show. Yes, and a couple things before that you wrap up. Safety. When you you feel as though, and I say this with a very heart of, there's nothing wrong with admiring people in ministry, all of that. But there are some times where sometimes in ministry, there are a lot Mm -hmm. of things that people can be so direct that there isn't any room to be raw. Absolutely. The other day was sometimes you, your personal self, have to go to God and tell God about God in the sense, Mm -hmm. God, this is how I feel about you. Yes. Yes. scared to do that because we feel like we're wrong or that God doesn't care or that he's going to punish us, or we feel shamed about it. And the reality (laughs) of the situation is, is that God can handle any emotion you feel about him. Literally. Everybody has one of those things. (laughs) And I've told God many (laughs) times, God, I don't trust you right now. God, Mm -hmm. because this is happening. And what he's always reminded me is, Mm -hmm. is that this had to come up. You Mm -hmm. need to be able to see that you don't trust me in this area. Yeah. Which yeah. Is why I had to allow this to happen so that it can be addressed. So most of the time when those anger feelings come up, he's always redirecting it of yes, yeah. it's coming towards me because he can handle it, but also uh-huh. I'm redirecting this to show you really where it's coming from mm-hmm. and why you needed to be vulnerable with me to do that. But you have mm-hmm. to know that in order to partner with someone you feel safe with, you have to be vulnerable with them. And if you yeah. are vulnerable with them about how you're Absolutely. really feeling. How can you have the expectation of safety? It's almost like you're in a relationship, but y'all don't talk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So you can't partner with them. I can't marry someone who I don't trust and not really be vulnerable with because vulnerability is going to happen in every relationship. Mm -hmm. Any fruitful relationship, vulnerability Mm -hmm. is a point for that. And it goes both ways, right? So it's like me being vulnerable, God, God, like this is hard. I feel like you're not showing up. I feel like you're pushing out my comfort zone. He will respond back and be like, okay, all right. So about this comfort zone, what you need it for? And bombard you, okay? And bombard you. Bombard you. It goes both ways. It's like, oh. So, I mean, yeah, he like kind of checking you, but he gave you room to process. And then he came in and was like, okay, so you scared of what? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. So, thank you. Because I do want you to say this, you know, yeah. you can even talk about some of the stuff you offer, but what would you want women to know about the assault of their identities within the purpose and doing the things that they're doing for God? Because I think a lot of times we don't recognize that when we yeah. make the step, mm-hmm. listen, it's almost yeah. like it's ready and waiting for you. Literally, they are like in the waiting. Assaulted. Mm-hmm. And I say that because it almost... You have to experience what it feels like to be uncomfortable in order to yeah. learn how to show up in your authority. This is why I believe Jesus had, when he fasted for 40 days, yeah. He yeah. came out, his authority was tested, but he knew what to do. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. that was before he did any miracles. That was before he did any ministry. That was after he was baptized. Like it was way before all these things happened. Yeah. You talk about what you want women to know about that. And and then also what transformational things do you do to help women with that? Yeah, I think it goes two ways. I think number one, I need to be able to just realistically be aware of the fact that when I make the decision to follow God, opposition is going to come, right? Like we can't be like, oh, I'm just going to follow God and everything's going to be like, child, please. That I, it's almost like an alarm goes off in hell and they like, oh, she get ready to move forward in a purpose. Let's, let's go get her, right? I think one, being able to acknowledge that, like be aware because some people are really in la la land and this is no shade to them. Maybe they just, you know, are just aren't aware. But I think it's important to realize that we have an active enemy. Like scripture literally tells us like we have, like he's a roaring lion, like constantly roaming the earth to see whom he can devour, right? And so one, being aware that we have an active enemy, but I think also two, being able to be aware of how you've responded to opposition before, that way you're able to kind of check yourself in the now. So like, for instance, If I know that as it relates to my purpose and being assaulted and me moving towards it, that my initial response is to draw back. I start getting inconsistent. I stop having, you know, research time. I stop doing like practical things to make execution a little bit easier. If I notice that I'm starting to shrink back, I'm now aware of the fact that maybe I need to tweak where I am. Like, for instance, if I know... I knew like, say for instance, January, I knew that the enemy was like, oh, she getting ready to start You being consistent. So I literally was like, I wrote down my schedule and I made myself every single day stick to a schedule because I knew that the assault for me in the past, I would fall off completely, right? Like I would completely go ghost. But if I had an actual schedule, I'm able to be like, okay, I see where this is. Let me put a practical piece in place so that I hold myself accountable, but also like just having that time with the Lord, like having actual, and whether it's quiet time or as you're going throughout your day, being able to be vocal with him about like, I feel like I'm starting to shrink back or I feel like there's like a really big assault. Help me to remember who you are and that you really are fighting for me, but also help me to remember who I am in you so that I can keep showing up. I think a reason why assaults win and why they have so much power over us because we really just don't know who God is and who we are in him, period. You know, like we can constantly go back, like, Lord, show me who I am. And a part of him showing us who we are is us actually showing up for ourselves too, to be like, see, I told you, you could do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, God, you're right. Everything you need. You don't need no <laughs> yeah. more. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need no more nothing. Just show up with what you have and let God do something like really miraculous. Like he is literally the God of multiplication. Like he will take a little bit and literally multiply it. And I've watched him do it time and time again. And multiplication may not always be tangible. Sometimes it's just, I have an excess of peace. I have an excess of joy. I thank God for that. I'll say this too. One of the things I realized more recently is that real Mm -hmm. freedom is the freedom to make mistakes Mm -hmm. honorable but I have more recently haven't felt so much freedom Mm -hmm. and being 
extremely like imperfect. Yeah. In a long time. That's freedom, but that's it's so a, much freedom. It took a lot of vulnerability, but it also took a lot yes. of like when I don't know what to do, God can give me the plan. Like, yes, I don't have a plan. You gonna- because you're not holding on to one. You're not holding yourself to that pressure of like. I got to have X, Y, Z figured out. I got to have da, 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 da. Like, and again, I think this goes back to our identity and how the enemy makes us feel like if we don't know all the answers, if we're not on performance mode or whatever, that we're not doing enough, Period. right? Like when you know who you are, you're like, you know what? If I make a mistake, okay. Mistakes or execution or the opposite of them or doing something right does not determine who I am in God, period. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get to find grace to make mistakes because I know who I am. True. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. why don't you tell the people where they can find you and then some of the things that you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on Instagram, it's I am underscore Rochelle Howard, like just my first and last name. A lot of what I do, I'm actually finishing up a cohort now um, called Unstoppable Academy. It's an eight week live group coaching program where I literally help women get to the core of their limiting beliefs so that they can live a life of purpose. We have ladies in there who are doing everything as far as like starting businesses. Some of them, their core belief is just not feeling like they are capable to do the things that God has called them to do. So we really deal with a lot of the self-awareness, helping them rewrite their story and putting a game plan in place so that they can go forward and who God has called them to be. We are finishing up the cohort now. So this current enrollment is not open, but I do have a waiting list. If you go to my Instagram, The 2022 cohort starts in February. And so if you want to join the waiting list for that, we'll start promotion probably around the top of the year. But if you want to lock in your spot, you can just go to my Instagram, go to my profile and the link in the profile, join the waiting list, and you'll be the first to know when that cohort actually is beginning to take enrollees. So yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you, sis. Y'all definitely go follow Rochelle on Instagram. <laughs> so awesome. Okay, we'll snatch all the edges. So much fun. <laughs> and then I will put all of her information in the show notes and I'll talk to y'all next week. Bye. Bye, guys.